Anything else? No. No. So, well, you know, I don't know where to start with Tom. I've known, I knew him for so long. I met him first in 1974 when I was a summer student at the lab working on the geothermal project. And Tom was just moving into his laboratory at uh, TA33. This is the site out by Bandelier for those of you that know the area. And, and I didn't work with Tom that summer, but uh, later on, five, five or so years later, I started to work with him. Um, so what I want to do is go through a sequence of photos and then talk a little bit about uh, how the science began, this science, nonlinear elasticity, at Los Alamos. And then um, Jim will, will, come, will uh, give you some reminiscence, reminiscences, personal re reminiscences from him. So I'll just walk you through some of these. This was, this was we were visiting a dear friend of ours, Gilles Bousseau, who's actually here. Uh, his parents in southern France, this was for Thanksgiving in 1992. My wife Susan and I were, were uh, down in southern France with Tom. We were all living in Paris at the time. And we had the great fortune of eating a French Thanksgiving dinner in southern France. That was outstanding. And this was part of it because before we had Thanksgiving, the day before, Tom and Susan and I went to a, a restaurant that Gilles knew very well and had the vrai bouillabaisse in Cassis, France, which is, Cassis is just east of Marseille on the coast. This is a group of, of ruffians, I'll call them. Um, this is Al Duba, some, some of you actually know him, Jean-Paul Poirier and Tom, and I don't know if this is Mike or uh, Mike Brown or someone else, I couldn't tell. But in any case, Tom worked with, with these two in particular a lot over the years on a uh, topic primarily of electroconductivity. And I will focus a little bit on that in a few moments. Duba was at Lawrence Livermore for his career, and Jean Paul Fourier was at the University of Paris at the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics. And so, sorry, some of this is focused on me and my wife because, well, it's my sort of personal uh, reminiscence and memorial to Tom, so forgive me for that. But this is with my wife Susan and Tom, that same visit to southern France um, in a small village nearby, Le, Le Bousset. And this was an extraordinary moment for me. This is when Tom was named fellow nominated fellow of the American Geophysical Union in 1994. Uh, first you get your medal, which you can see around Tom's neck, and uh, then you have a big dinner with, at a big table with friends and colleagues. So that was a wonderful time um, when Tom received his, this great honor. Then uh, let's talk a little bit about the ICNEMS, the International Conferences on Nonlinear Elasticity and Materials. Um, this one was held in Sorrento, and I'll come back to the origin of that in a few minutes. This was in Sorrento, Italy in 2004. Um, this was with colleagues Alexander Sutin and Eric Smith. Um, Alex, Sasha Sutin would be here normally, but he, he was unable to make it. But it looks as if we'd have, everybody's had a rough day, and in particular Tom. And it looks like much wine has been had, although there's no evidence for it here. Maybe it was just a hard day of science. So, some of Tom's honors, and this is a short list, he was an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow in the 90s and also in 2006 in Germany. He got the Los Alamos Achievement Award in 96. He was a fellow, as I mentioned, of the AGU, nominated in 1994. He, was, he took a post Rouge, CNRS post Rouge uh, position in France for a year in 91 92. And that's the time that we all lived together um, on Boulevard Voltaire in Paris for some time after Rebecca, his wife, had left. And you can see some other uh, honors as well. So Tom had a particular flair when he gave a lecture. And his ties were one aspect of that, in addition just to his inimitable style. But that tie is something else. 
he, he's one of the few people I know that would dare wear that, except Tarek Sawa, who's also here. He would wear a tie like that. So let's just talk a little bit about Tom's contributions in science. Um, Tom really focused on electrical conductivity and thermodynamics in regards to um, the Earth's mantle and core and lower crust as well. This is Tom's most cited paper, um, Brown and Shanklin, and this was a, a sort of a foundational paper in terms of pulling out thermodynamic parameters of the Earth from seismic profiles. This is an, another highly cited paper. This is on partial melt and electrical conductivity. Uh, these are anomalies in the upper mantle that Tom was exploring with, with, uh, with, with WAF. And also, this, this work went on with a number of people, inc including Jean-Paul Poirier and Al Duba. And a, another group of, of well-known papers in the literature, one with Mark Ander, this is on electrical conductivity temperatures and fluids in the lower crust again. And this went on partial melting and electrical conductivity and anomalies in the upper mantle with, with WAF as well. And this one published in Science, also a foundational paper on these are these are mantle minerals, uh, olivine, wadclayite, and ringwoodite in upper mantle conditions. So this is a, this is experimental work that Tom conducted with this group of individuals. So now I want to just pivot to sort of the origin of the work many of us share in this room in regards to nonlinear elasticity of earth materials industrial materials, etc. So the topic expanded originally from, from rocks, earth materials, to, to non-destructive evaluation of materials, etc. Uh, and many of the people in this room are working on that rather than earth materials. But so the, here's the backstory. Um, in about 1980, um, our, a colleague of ours who, were work, who was also working on the Hot Dry Rock Project at TA33, was, uh, his name is Jim Albright. He was on an airplane and he'd been given this book or obtained this book somehow called Science, Technology, and the Modern Navy. And he was just leaping through it. And he came across the following paper um, by Tom Year. Tom Year will, will add, some of you know Tom, some of you know him very well actually. And, and Jim Albright was reading about this concept of the parametric array. So this had been tested in the air and in, and in water. And the idea is you send two, high, two higher frequency waves, collinear, on, in, in, in one direction, and they multiply. Everybody in this room knows that, almost everybody. They multiply, and you create sum and difference frequencies, which, are, which is a nonlinear process. A, not, not a linear process because otherwise you would end up in a linear world you'd end up with just the two waves you input into the system you wouldn't produce these other waves as well so Albright got to thinking of well could this work in earth materials so that was really the beginning I think what happened is he talked to Tom Tom talked to Rick O'Connell they wrote a proposal to Office of Science they were actually funded to work on this topic, which nobody had ever heard of, was arcane, and not of much interest to many people at the time, but they were funded, and that was the beginning. I think they obtained their funds in about 1980. Um, then I, I came for a summer, I was at the University of Arizona doing my master's degree. Uh, my wife and I were both working on our degrees in Tucson. I came one summer, probably it was 1982, no, 1983, and the work was really just getting going. So Rick O'Connell and Tom and I sat in the Tritium building, some of you know, at TA33, trying to make this experiment work where we were mixing beams in rocks collinearly. But we found it so difficult, and many of those in the room can appreciate this, we had, we had never worked in this domain at all, and we couldn't sort out the effects of the amplifiers, the transducers, the coupling from the response of, of the material. So 
we decided, well, one of us, I don't know who it was, pulled up a paper by Taylor and Rawlings where they did non-collinear interaction. So that it was much easier to separate the effects of pulling out the difference frequency um, from the source effects and other effects that would contaminate the result. So that was sort of the inspiration as we went down this path of non-collinear mixing. So it took some time, as you can see, this paper was published in 1987, to convince ourselves that what we were seeing was real, and then to convince AGU to actually publish this paper. They'd never seen anything quite like it, I guess. But anyway, this was the first paper we published together, myself, Tom, Rick O'Connell, and Jim Albright. And this is just the experimental layout, for those of you who aren't familiar, where you put two, two waves in, two compressional waves, and in this case, you get a shear wave out. At, that, at, a, at, a pre at a prescribed angle. So, but some, some, we, as far as we knew, no one else was working on this topic, at least for earth materials. But it turns out that there was a group in Nizhny Novgorod in Russia that were simultaneously working on similar problems. They were mostly focused on air and water and non-destructive evaluation. They were working on, you know, the hunt for red October kinds of submarine problems, etc. They were like the Navy lab as, as well here. But there were a number of people, including Alexander Sutin, Sasha, Lev Ostrovsky, who was supposed to be here this morning, and others, Lebedev, Andre Lebedev, and others working on related problems. And we didn't discover them until roughly 19, I think it was 1991, at the International Symposium of Nonlinear Acoustics held in Austin, Texas. That was and, the first time we crossed paths. And it's worth noting that a very similar effort was going on By the way, can you hear me in back? Okay, so, so right, so there was this whole world of nonlinear acoustics that Jim came from that we were only aware of tangentially, and then ultimately when, when we attended the, the International Symposium on Nonlinear Acoustics in Austin, we all crossed paths. And that means that at that time things kind of exploded because our two worlds crossed, we had expertise from uh, the world that really knew this topic and expertise from geophysics. And that's when things really started to move along. Um, these are some of the papers that were being published at the time out of the Institute of Applied Physics, Physics in Nizhny um, from a host of authors, some we recognize, Ostrovsky, Sutin, Sustova, Nazarov. Uh, these are names that uh, many of us in the room know. This is just a small selection of the papers that were coming out of the Institute at that time and are st they're still working on this topic in Nizhny. Um, and then in the early 90s, um, I, don't, I don't know how I discovered uh, that Igor Berezneff and Alexei Nikolaev were working on nonlinear seismic effects. So they were trying to do beam mixing in the earth uh, using large vibrators, the kind you use for oil exploration. And that was Igor's thesis, and he published uh, several papers. This one was in Physics of Earth and Planetary Interiors. Um, and um, I, perhaps I came across the paper, and that's how I got in touch with Igor. And we started to visit each other. He came to visit Tom and me. I went to visit Igor, and we began to work together. Igor actually came here for about six months, and he and Tom and I and some, several others worked together. So before I get to the next paper, at that point, this is when we encountered a number of other people, including our, our, our dear colleague, colleague Robert Geyer and Catherine McCall, and they brought in really rigorous theoretical underpinnings to what we were doing, and that was sort of the beginning of this PM space model that we've heard a lot about yesterday and we'll continue hearing about during this meeting. So, so then Jim, Jim Tenkei came along as a postdoc, Kun Ben Denabelo, was working at, at the time. There were a number of students as well. But this was sort of the foundational paper on slow dynamics. 
So, so Patrick Rosolfson and ben Bernard Zanzner, again, some of you know them, in France, and I had worked on using resonant bar kind of type of experiments. We were looking at fast dynamics and slow dynamics. And we, well, we saw slow dynamics, uh, but we didn't pursue it. We realized they were there. We didn't pursue it. We were really focused on the fast nonlinear dynamics. But, it, but when Tom and G Jim started to think about the problem, they really conducted some rigorous studies of the slow dynamics in rock and wrote this paper. And this paper really is, we've seen this figures out of this paper many times yesterday. So this was an important contribution and a foundational contribution to the domain in terms of our understanding of slow dynamics in earth materials. Along with that, uh, starting in 96, Tom suggested, Tom Shanklin suggested that we host a, a small meeting on the topic and try to get together people that were actually working in this area. We would host it at Los Alamos at I IGPP, the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics. And Chick Keller, who was head of IGPP at the time, was really enthusiastic about supporting it. So we brought Tom, well, Tom was there, Rick O'Connell, Robert Geyer, who's sitting here, Catherine McCall, who's sitting here, Ted Tate, sitting here, Abe Kadish, who's no longer with us, Bernard Lanzner came from France, as did Patrick Rosalveson, Brian Bonner came from Lawrence, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, Kuhn was there, and, and myself. So this was the, I think I have this list of cast of characters correct, but this was the first meeting on, on ICNAM, which probably is, was sort of the origin of the Pac-Man conference as well, the conference we're at today. We had a yearly meeting all through until the pandemic when it's been disrupted. And we've had a couple cancellations and hopefully there'll be another ICNAM next year. But in any case, it turned into a yearly event, uh, first in Los Alamos for four years at IGPP. But then next we went to Santa Margarita in Italy and then we went started to go to marvelous places. We, we quit going to Los Alamos. Not that this is <laughs> marvelous for some of you, but it's nice to get away to Italy or France or somewhere, somewhere beautiful like that where you eat so well. That's different than here. Um, so that's the origin of the International Conference on Nonlinear Elasticity and Materials. And hopefully that will continue. Some of the ICNAM meetings, this was on Vesuvius in Sorrento, outside of Sorrento in 2005. The meeting was in Sorrento. Here we see Tom and the lovely Rebecca, who's in the back of the room, who's joined us. Uh, and this is some of the people that were there for the meeting. And not, not everybody, but we had a tour of Vesuvius with a, a, a volcanologist, which was absolutely fabulous. I don't know who this guy was and why he's run this. Maybe somebody recognizes him. But you can see uh, many of us there and, and younger, <laughs> considerably younger. And another shot, this one was in, from Taormina in 2005, I think. I, uh, Tim Darling, who's here, sent this picture uh, to, to us last night. Um, you, you, can, you can read the names yourself, but Bonner's there, who many of us know. Um, I think this is Lou Gush. I'm not sure. No. No. Okay. TJ, who looks like he's 10. <laughs> um, Tom, myself, my wife Susan, and Tim Darling. So, I mean, at this point, you know, the topic has grown uh, dramatically. There are people working on in, on topics related to this conference, really focused on non-destructive evaluation, but also earth sciences as well. And there are groups all over the world working on it now. This has expanded dramatically since we first started working on it. And I, I would say much in part to the work that originated here and with our colleagues, uh, our collaborators, Los Alamos and others. So much in thanks to you know, Tom's early efforts and Rick O'Connell's early efforts and support we obtained from IGPP through Chick Keller at Los Alamos. So, um, <laughs> when I see this picture, I, can, I cannot believe it. Um, just 
how uh, this handsome young buck. I don't. I don't know if I ever saw Tom without a mustache or beard, for one thing. But um, you know, it's just this marvelous picture showing Tom in, in one of the places he loved the most in the mountains. You know, Tom and I skied together. We mountain biked together. He would come back with scratches all over him after a mountain bike ride. It was a remarkable. Had a, this 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 remarkable ability to head into most bushes. Uh, in, it, it seemed like it was intentional. Uh, but uh, he, liked, he loved the challenge. Um, but um, we'll miss Tom um, very much, but uh, so, so thankful that I knew Tom. So now um, Jim's going to offer some reminiscences himself before we move on with the science. Okay, that's a good picture to leave up there. Maybe, I don't know if TJ wants to film this too. So we, we thought we would try to do this sort of, I would give a, a, you an idea of what it was like to have Tom as a mentor. And you know, so Paul gave you an overview. So let me tell you what it was like working with him. And um, I sat down and started writing down just a bunch of stuff. I made a whole bullet list. And before you know it, in five minutes, I had two pages of bullets. So I'm going to, Try to capture all of them, and if I run out of time, I won't get through all of them. But anyway, so this is an unusual way for me to give a talk, reading from a bunch of bullets. But let me see how it goes. Uh, so I got to Los Alamos, sort of summer of 1994. Doug Megan had already left, and I had met Doug and Paul at UT Austin. They had come down to look at the research that Muir and Crowd were doing. Uh, I was supposed to take the place of a postdoc named Randy Cherry, who decided he hated science and went off to law school. And by the way, I looked him up and he is now a law professor at SMU. So, um, anyway, Paul was really worried and he wanted to make sure I got here early because Randy knew all about this cool thing called LabVIEW and he had programmed all of these experiments that Paul wanted to make sure that that information got passed on to me. I showed up and looked at Randy's code and said, this is terrible. <laughs> and uh, Paul, oh, good. Uh, he, was, he was relieved. And believe it or not, the next week he went off to France. <laughs> so guess what happened? Tom Shanklin became my de facto mentor at that point. Okay, so I realized that if the lights are dim, I can't read my notes. <laughs> Put on my reading guide. Okay, um, so the first thing that Paul and Tom decided I should do was to redo the experiment that Doug Megan had done. Put down waves on a long thin bar and see if we could model it and get an idea of what the nonlinearity was because the numbers Doug came up with were extraordinarily large. And this was a big deal to the whole nonlinear acoustics crowd too. We talk about the coefficient of nonlinearity on the order of three and a half or five for water. And the rock guys, they were getting thousands, tens of thousands. This just didn't seem real to us. So we wanted to redo that experiment. Kuhn was doing modeling at the time, and we wanted to see whether or not we could get more realistic values. And we bought a whole brand new long thin bar, much more thin than the one Doug had used, and we didn't weld a bunch of transducers and make a periodic structure, which Doug did. And that went along fine. Tom was sort of watching over all of this. We had our meetings. And that sort of wound down nicely. The paper came out of it. And Paul had again gone off to France, I think. And Tom said, you know what? So let me give you some background. Paul was in France doing resonance measurements on rocks. You take a bar. And you ping it, and you look for the resonant frequency. And they were doing this with an old analog plotter that they would then digitize to get the data. Remember, this is early 90s. This was Mac 2 era. This was DOS. Um, so this was ancient history to all, most of you. Anyway, so Tom and I were talking, and Tom says, you really need to program up that frequency sweep in LabVIEW. And let's, let's do it carefully so we can control it and we have the data digitized right away. So while Paul was off in France, 
I wrote probably the first NRUS code, and Tom and I were sitting in the lab going back and forth trying to understand what we were seeing because it wasn't repeatable. And um, that's one of the things I want to bring up about Tom. You know, I have the experiment all programmed up. We do a measurement. He'd come in usually in the afternoon, sit with me, and nod off. And, and he would be chatting away with me and just sort of nod off. And what seemed like an eternity later, he'd suddenly wake up and continue the discussion right where he left off. You know, back in those days, you had a lot of time between data points because you were averaging like crazy just to get the decent signal. And so it was like watching grass grow, and I was fascinated watching why, what was going on. And Tom and I had heated arguments about, well, why, maybe it's the program, because we're stepping in frequency, maybe it's the steps causing this odd jumping behavior in the slope. It was great, um, including the, the business of nodding off. Now, another thing I should mention to you is conversations with Tom were very nonlinear. So Tom was great at starting a topic and then going off onto a tangent. So we talk about something in the science and that would lead in a curious way to something here. And then he would go way uh, off topic, somewhere out here, and then he suddenly realized, oh, we digressed a bit and pop right back to the center idea where we're going and move up in the conversation. And that's interesting to me because I had a friend in college who I did a lot of research with and we would be talking problem sets over the phone late at night and we would get off on tangents and we'd suddenly say, well, how did we get here? And we would go and trace our conversations back. Tom would just go snap right back and keep going. And it was great fun. Let's see. Um, I want to make sure I don't miss any of my cool thoughts, although I could do this for hours. So, um, okay, so um, I should mention that one of the cool things about all these tangents, I learned so much geophysics from just those tangents. I, I, I'm indebted to him for that. I, because I came from an acoustics background. I was physics. I was underwater acoustics. I didn't know anything about rocks. And so Tom would sort of lead me along and tell me how that all worked. Okay, so about a year or so after we had sort of done all that slow dynamics measurement, we finally figured out what was going on. We could finally reproduce things. We finally had something that we thought was publishable. And then Tom and I had long discussions well, you can't just put a bunch of data and publish it because nobody will publish a bunch of observations. And that's still a little bit true today. So we were working on talking about, and Tom says, no, it's got to go, and if GRL is the right place to put it in. And he said, so here are the four things I wrote. I made the plots pretty. We then wordsmithed the document. And fortunately, I had worked with David Blackstock, who was an associate editor for JASA, the Acoustical Society Journal, for years and years and years. So Blackstock had already turned me into a good writer. And I discovered that Tom Shanklin and David Blackstock were at Harvard at exactly the same time. They had bumped into each other, they didn't work with each other, but the two of them were so similar. It was striking to me how similar the two of them were. And that paper then got put together, and it, it the first, so I should read to you what I, I learned about publishing. Um, we put together the paper, we submitted it, and the reviews both came back positive. In fact, one of the reviews said, this, this is cool stuff, publish it as it is. And it, I found out later that Brian Bonner had written that review. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So that sort of started the whole discussion of slow dynamics. And the, the meeting yesterday, you heard all about slow dynamics. And we had a lot of discussion. I should add something else about slow dynamics. So we had the paper written. We couldn't think of a catchy title. So Tom and I go to Robert. I think Catherine was there too. And we said, so we want to publish this. This is what, what, what do you think? 
Well, what, what should we call this stuff? And Robert goes, well, I don't know. How about slow dynamics? And we said, great, great. And that's where the term came from. Thanks to Robert. <laughs> all right, so I should tell you something else sort of as an aside. So during all these experiments, Tom sitting watching me, looking over my shoulder, having discussions, we would have lunch breaks because a lot of times the experiments would run into the night. We try to automate things. And so we would do various things. In the winter time, we would go cross country skiing at the Bandelier Loops. And Tom would teach me that I didn't really know anything about cross country skiing, in spite of coming from Michigan, and that's what I did. Uh, he taught me all sorts of cool stuff about, about that. He taught me a little bit about downhill skiing. I'm still not very good, but I at least can get down without killing myself. But what was cool is as, as Tom got older and Paul and Peter and the other Gonzo mountain bikers were just way out of his league, he took it upon himself to teach me how to mountain bike. And so we, we would spend summers biking throughout the area and it, as a matter of fact I was always surprised because as Tom pointed out Tom would go I think there's a trail here and and he would just head off into the woods on his bike and make me follow it. That's the scratches. That's the scratch. Well it was more than scratches. I mean there were cool places. He had a place he called practice rocks where you could there's a bunch of big boulders and you had to go over that. I was like you could go over that with your bike? He goes, oh yeah, watch. And then he'd fall or something crazy and he'd come back all bruised up. And it, it was great fun. So that's the Tom Shanklin that I knew. He was my mentor. I'll miss him. And I should, I'm going to conclude with one thing. The shirt I'm wearing is from the Harvard Coop. And Tom and I discovered that when we went to any kind of a conference or any kind of a talk, to dress up, we'd find our nice. Oxford thinks, and a picture of Tom in there, he's wearing one of these striped shirts. So I wore this today in honor of Tom, and just wanted to let you know what it was like to work with him.